So welcome all of you teachers and CodeMonkey users to the second webinar of our back to school season, how to set up and manage your classrooms. The CodeMonkey team wants to personally thank you for joining us for our webinar today. And we know that your time obviously has been just turned upside down with everything that you're facing and how everything in education has been shaken up. So our goal today is to make sure that you're getting what you need out of today's webinar to help better prepare you to teach CodeMonkey with your students. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. That's why we have a team um, with us to kind of help guide you through that process. Um, so be sure to follow us on all of our um, social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, well, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, um, at CodeMonkeySTU, and then we also have our blog. So feel free to go ahead and check that out as well. Um, my um, team is here to answer any questions that you may have, so please chat with us along the side. And if you have any questions, please um, enter them in the Q&A box. Uh, last week when we did our webinar, the chats kind of got, the chat questions kind of got lost. So we wanna make sure that you're able to enter those. So you can go ahead and enter those um, inside of the Q&A box and then we'll go ahead and answer those. Some questions may be left till the end because they might be for the greater good of everybody um, for today's webinar. So if we don't get to it right away, we will get to it. And if we don't get to it today, we'll make sure that we um, follow up with you immediately following today's webinar. Um, okay, great. So. Um, following today's webinar, we will also have a survey that will pop up and in that survey will be um, your professional development certificate that will be mailed immediately to you afterwards. So let's go ahead and get ready to write code, catch bananas, and save the world. So today is going to be the tour of courses webinar. So we are going to focus on the tour of courses. Um, but before we get started, we always like to introduce the team that is here and um, so you can get familiar with who you'll be alongside this afternoon. Um, so my name is Lena Saleh and I'm the professional development and sales manager here at CodeMonkey. I've been in education for, well, almost 12 years now. I was in the classroom for 10 of those. Um, I taught anything from all the way from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade, wrote digital curriculum, and I do a lot of work in the space. So that's a little bit about me. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, and if you have any questions directly following today's webinar, you can obviously always welcome you to email me with any questions that you have. All right, now let's meet the rest of the team. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Zach. I'm the Director of Sales, working uh, with many of the states like New York, Pennsylvania, um, Connecticut and a bunch of others here to answer any questions you may have. And if you're interested afterwards in moving forward uh, to learn a little bit more about CodeMonkey, uh, here's my details and they'll probably get emailed to you as well after um, this session. So nice to meet everyone. Hi everybody, I'm Brett. I'm the VP of sales here at CodeMonkey. And so I've been in ed tech for quite a while, worked with several different companies and ultimately really love computer science and coding education and making sure that students have this opportunity to learn these necessary skills. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Molly. I'm also on the sales team. I um, started at CodeMonkey back in January, but have been in the industry for a little over six years. I'm also here to help Zach and Brett answer questions. So thanks again for joining us today. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'm glad you guys got to meet the team a little bit there. And so just remember that we are here to honor your time and honor your questions. So feel free to shoot those in the Q&A box and then any informal questions in the chat. And it's also a time for you to communicate with each other as well. So we encourage that too. Um, before we kind of get started here, um, I always like to start off each of the webinars with a poll, just kind of seeing who you are and just kind of getting a feel for our audience for today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll and I'm going to give you just a few minutes to go ahead and take that. And then we will go ahead and get started with our webinar.
All righty, we'll get you just a couple more minutes here or just a couple more seconds, I guess you would say, um, to go ahead and complete this quiz here, just to kind of get a feel for our audience for this afternoon. Uh, Katrina, if you're having trouble um, submitting for the poll, you can um, feel free to either add that here in the chat box or um, sometimes it's just a connect connection issue with Zoom. Okay, great. It looks like majority of you have had the chance to vote. It sounds like some of you are having a little bit of issues with that, which is totally fine. Um, but <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and share these. Um, I'm going to end the result or end the poll here, and then I'm going to share the results with you just so you guys can kind of see. So most of the people um, just checking to see how you feel so far with Code Monkey, and most of you are kind of somewhat in the middle, which is great. Um, with majority of you needing a little bit of help. So that's exactly what today's webinar is here for. Um, what is your role in the organization? Um, it seems like it's pretty tied up between um, most of the positions here. So elementary, and middle school, um, library, um, and then some of you in the other category. So probably technology teacher or something around that uh, landscape. Um, how comfortable do you feel with coding? It seems most of you are either in the middle or you are a novice. So um so just wanted to share that too so so of course feel free to ask those questions and we'll give you some resources here at the end to just support you the best that we can all right great so now we're going to go ahead and get started and so we always like to start off with just talking about what code monkey is um who are we and kind of what is our vision for the future so Code Monkey is a leading coding program for students to engage them in online um, courses to learn how to code. Um, it is made with schools and teachers in mind, and then we are standards aligned, and it is a coding curriculum for K through eight, so we will go through that today. And the best part about it is that there's no experience needed to teach our program. Um, so Code Monkey does envision a global, global, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> global playful learning experience where the next generation of coders are born and raised. We do have about 10 million users worldwide. So we do have users, you know, all across the globe and hopefully some of you are joining us from around the world as well. Um, we aim, part of our vision is that we aim to create a engaging platform where you're learning along, learning knowledge alongside 21st century skills through collaboratively playing, solving puzzles, excuse me, inventing, creating and sharing. Um, so today's webinar objectives are going to be that we're going to tour the courses. We are going to showcase a few challenges from each and every single course to give you kind of a rundown and give you a little bit of a chance to kind of explore what the platform looks like and have any questions along the way. Um, then we'll tour the teacher resources and then we'll review limiting student progress and then we'll go ahead and um, have some time for some Q&A. We also took some of the Q&A from your registration questions and we'll be sure to answer that. Um, and we will answer some of your questions, like I said, along the way. So keep an eye out in the chat box for some of the links and different things that we'll share for, for you as we get started. So how does CodeMonkey kind of work and what kinds of courses do we offer? So we are, like I mentioned, a coding curriculum for grades K through eight. However, we do have a lot of high school programs using um, CodeMonkey for their intro to programming. Um, we like to think about language if I were to start learning a language today and you were to start learning the language today, we would start both at the same place. So sometimes that's exactly what, how we like to think about coding um, throughout how we offer it for our students. So beginning at the beginning, we will dive deeper into each of these courses where we have our CodeMonkey Junior course, which is a block-based course really about computational thinking and directionality. Then we have our Beaver Achiever course. There are three uh, courses within this one and they work through sequencing conditional statements and then if and else statements at the end so um, that's the focus of that one then we have our coding adventure course and that's where we start coffee script right away so coffee script dota does math and game builder courses are all in coffee script and coffee script is a shorter version of javascript and python we found that working with students 
um, that the syntax sometimes would tie them up. We know that it's really tricky for students to add a period or a, you know, a question mark, even where it needs to be. So having syntax at an early age can be really troublesome for students to really get the foundations that they need for the programming. Um, and then we'll get into our banana tails, which is our Python course with geared for our upper um, elementary and middle school students. And then we have our coding chatbot course, which we'll briefly look out here um, as we get moving through. So first let's start out with our Code Monkey Junior course and let's take a look at exactly what that looks like. So Code Monkey Junior is geared for our pre-K, K, we call it for our pre-readers course. Um, there are 30 challenges that we have and they are divided into four chapters. So there's basically four, um, concepts that they're working on there. Um, each of the lessons within that are each 35 minutes and it takes about three months to complete if you are doing those lessons only once per week. And it is a block based program and they focus on logic, loops, sequencing, algorithms, counting and directionality like I had mentioned before. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at what that actually looks like in the program itself. So here I'm already logged in as you can see to the CodeMonkey platform. What I'm going to do is I'm in my classrooms dashboard page right here, but I want to go to the courses. So I'll click on the courses and the code monkey junior course is going to be um, Located here sort of in the middle of the page here. You'll see this little cute monkey holding the bananas with the treasure box. Um, so if you were just beginning coding, it would say beginning coding, but here it said to continue coding because I've already um, began the process. CodeMonkey Junior is the only program that we do have that's available on an app. So the students will sign in and we'll save their progress and they'll report back to you, which we'll see that um, feature as well. So as that is, um, as the students are working through, <laughs> through this, um, it's just a really good course to talk about computational thinking. So I am just going to um, do a little something here. And I see that my, I've been having um, computer type issues all day today. So we'll go ahead and um, we'll come back to this CodeMonkey Junior course here in just a minute. Um, just gonna let that kind of load as we go through. So we'll take a look at that. I'll make sure I follow back with that at the end here. Um, so then next we have our Beaver Achiever course and our Beaver Achiever course is for grades one through three. Um, Beaver Achiever has 55 challenges and that is divided into three courses like I had mentioned. There are 11 35 minute lesson plans and if you go ahead and work through those it'll take about three months to complete if you were only teaching it once per week. Obviously there's a lot more um, opportunities to kind of expand upon that and um, you know take a little bit more time to deep dive into those concepts that are presented. So the first concept, the first course that I mentioned is sequencing loops and we do a little bit of repeat loops. Then we do conditionals and until loops and then we work into if and else conditions. So let's take a look at what that looks like in the Beaver Achiever course since our CodeMonkey Junior course doesn't seem to be loading here for me right now. The joys of technology, right? Always, I gotta have something. Um, so our Beaver Achiever course, I'll start off here at the very beginning. All of the Code Monkey courses are set up in a similar manner. Um, they are fully gamified and it means that the students are able to work through in a linear manner. So they can't skip around, learn something before they're ready. The goal is really to reinforce the coding concepts which are being presented. We really want the students to build that strong foundation so that when they are ready to become those true web developers, um, that they have the, the skill set really needed to move to that next step. And a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of gaps when you work through the coding programs that way. So here is our beaver. He's one of my favorite characters throughout the coding adventure, I mean, throughout the CodeMonkey platform. He um, is super cute. Um, what you can see here is that he, every single one of our stories for the exception of coding chatbots and the exception of our game builder courses um, will have a storyline. So the storyline here at the very beginning is that the beaver here is um, wants to go swimming so he needs to build a dam. So we can see that each one of these rows mean one and then at the very beginning it's just kind of dragging and dropping. So what's really nice is that there's pictures here also to support that for your for your students that might be struggling readers. 
Um, and then what you'll do is you'll hit the green button here and hit play. If I were doing a lesson with students, I would let them guide me through the process and see what we need to do here and how we can make this beaver fill up his dam. And you'll see there's really fun um, little animations that are associated with that. And then we'll see that we get a star scoring solution. So a three star solution is our shortest, most concise code. A two star means that there was an extra step and a one star I always like to say are the struggle bussers. Um, and that just means that they took probably didn't really understand the concept that was presented to them. And then they um, probably need a little bit of guidance and help from you. So those will all report on the teacher side. So we'll dive into that piece. But right now I just want to dive into what the courses look like themselves. So what you can see is we have a story map up here on the upper right hand corner. And as the students progress through the challenges, as teachers, you can manipulate this, you can move around, but as students, they have to move linearly through the concept that ensures that they're not skipping around and learning something before they're ready, but they're building the foundation, which is what we want to have. You can't build a house without a strong foundation, right? So then we um, will go ahead and look at another one of these challenges here. Let's go ahead to challenge number 18. So I'm just going to show you what it kind of looks like as they progress. You'll see that now we start to see a lot more pattern recognition, a lot more computational thinking. How do I break this down? A lot more algorithmic thinking. How do I plan this out step by step? A student that is a struggle buster will not remember how to use a loop and might not really understand the concept of using a loop itself. There are always multiple ways to solve some of our, our coding exercises here, but we really want to ensure that they really understand what a loop means and exactly how to utilize it and why do we use a loop. And the goal is that we want to have the shortest, most concise code always possible but it's like math, there's always multiple ways to solve any of the coding challenges. And so as we work through this, we'll see that the code is highlighting as we go through the blocks. It will also flash when we're going to be repeating the loop itself. So, so it gives the students a lot of things to kind of recognize. The scene is on the right-hand side where we're programming is in the middle and all of the features are on the left-hand side for them to use. It is drag and drop. Um, we did used to only have text based with these younger students, but we just found that the, they needed a little bit more support. And so the block based course has been a really great addition for these students when we've done them in product testing. And this is one of our newer courses. So we're really excited to see teachers utilize this this year. So that is part one of the Beaver Achiever course. Let's go ahead and let's go back to our story map and let's look at the conditional statements. So part two is conditional statements. When they go through conditionals here, they're going to help the beaver build his house. Um, it's raining, he needs a house. And so here there's something else that's happening. So we see that there is a plank. What do we need to do? It tells us that we need to pick up a log and then we need to chop it. So let's take a look at what happens. And if, like I said, if I were a student and I were running this in a classroom, I would have them run it. Um, but we can see here that we failed on the first attempt, which is fine. Coding is all about failing forward, what I like to say here. So we'll see that there is a super hint here. And so we'll click on the hint here and the hint will let us know that we pick it up, but we also need to chop the wood probably a little bit further than we chopped the wood the first time to get the plank into the correct spot. All right, so now that we were able to Go ahead and get that. Um, we see that we had a three star solution as well. The beaver is dancing. Um, there are some fun um, anime, I mean, some fun sounds that are also associated with this. I was doing product testing with this when this first was launched with the students and they were dancing alongside the beaver and it was really great to see them you know, having that lack of, in, you know, lack of inhibition. They're so excited to kind of showcase um, and celebrate with the beaver. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so here now we are on challenge 15. I just moved through the story map in the upper right hand corner to go to the last challenge within this coding map. And we'll see that it's a little bit more complicated. It's building in complexity as it goes. And so we have different size, um, we have different size uh, planks as we go along. So we can see what those look like. And as the students have gotten to this point, they'll kind of understand what each of the plank sizes mean and how they approach it. And then we'll just go ahead and show the solution. We can see we have a we have a loop, and then we also have nested loops inside of there. So there's a lot more thinking that's involved that kind of goes with this. Um, I see Richard here. You have a question about can the students skip around between challenges? They cannot. 
what they will see, they're able to see their solutions on the map itself, but they're not actually, they are not actually skipping through the challenges. We want to ensure that they have a mastery of understanding and that they're not just going from one to 15, because if they did, they would really miss a lot of the concepts in between. And they, that's when you have 9,000 hands in the air, really asking you those questions. So we wanna make sure that we are really supporting them and giving them that foundation. But great question. So a question we get a lot. So, all right, so that's reporting back. And now we're getting to my most favorite part of the Beaver Achiever course. And that is our last one, which is the if and else conditionals. So here in this course, the beaver, basically the more likes that he gets, the busier he's going to be at his smoothie shop. Um, so we are going to be building our friends or our customers smoothies. So what we can see here is it's very visual. We can see we're going to have one customer, which will match the button that we have over here. We have our character or our customer and our customer is, in this case is going to be a monkey and the monkey is going to like bananas. So what I'll do is I'll drag it over. We can see we can also click between the different fruit options that are the fruit and honey options that are there. And then what we'll do is we can drag out this button to blend and serve. But let's say I don't do that. I bring out this, I can see that I have a monkey and I have the banana. What's going to happen? My character comes, in this case, it is a, um, the girl monkey. I have my super hint that's here. Let's say I don't do that, but now I know I need to blend and serve. So there's another step that needs to be taken in the process to be able to solve this challenge. Um, so then we go ahead and we get our three star solution here and then I'll just go ahead and show you what this looks like at the very end of this challenge. Just, I mean, the very end of this course. So I'm just going to go to challenge 19 here and then Katrina, I see your question there. I'll go ahead and answer that here in just a few minutes. Um, so here is again our beaver and now we see it starts to get a little bit more complicated. We have our bear, we have our rabbit, we have our moose or elk. And we see that each one of them has something that they like. But what we see is that the bear and the moose or the elk have the same um, preference, except for the bear likes to have honey. So here's where we'll see an if and else conditional happen. So we see if the rabbit comes, we'll add carrots. Otherwise, if anyone else comes, they'll get strawberries. But if the bear comes, then he'll get honey specifically. We'll see the same thing kind of running through here. Um, the he'll make the combination you can see where it's being highlighted in the text which is really great to see as well so the students have an understanding of where the code is actually running i think sometimes the students just see it and they just think it's happening but here the highlighting portion really allows for them to see the code working through the way that it is um katrina had a question are the hint boxes audio activated or only text do the students have teacher support to this online coding experience? So we'll talk about some of the ways that the teachers can support on the opposite side of things. Um, these hints are something that are automatically executed when the student fails. The hint will pop up and um, there's some abilities in the teacher features that you can kind of control that. But in this experience here, these are automatically come up and if you saw they weren't actually there is audio for the sounds themselves but these buttons themselves don't actually narrate um, but I just have the sounds turned off right now so that's what we're seeing here and now we can see the if and else conditionals and I turned the sound I realized the sound was off but now I can turn the sound on um, so that's our beaver achiever course and like I mentioned I'll go back to that code monkey junior course here in just a little bit I see that my computer was not wanting to hang out with that for some reason. Okay, so next we'll move on to our text-based coding course. So let's take a look at um, what that looks like. So we talked about our Beaver Achiever and now we have our Coding Adventure course. So Coding Adventure is really geared for grades three through eight. And you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, that's such a huge gap between the students and the grade levels. But actually it's not because it does, it is very robust and builds in complexity as it goes. So we do have many middle schoolers, like I mentioned, even some high school students that are taking this course because we think about coding as a language. Um, here in this course itself, there are 210 story mode challenges and 210 skill modes. So all in all, there's about 420 challenges that students can work through. Um, it's a lot of content, but it really prepares them um, strongly in those foundational concepts. There are 48 lessons total. Basically, there's 16 per course. And if you were to go ahead and teach those together, if you only taught them once per week, it would be about a semester and a half worth of content. Um, typically, 
it's really rare that we will see students go all the way through that when the teachers are delivering lessons to them. So there's lots of ways that you can kind of um, scaffold that for year, year over year. Um, the programming language that I mentioned is CoffeeScript and Encoding Adventure, we're gonna focus on statements, loops, for loops, array and indexing, and then we'll get into functions and Boolean operators and logic. Um, and then at the end, we'll get into more of the gamification and kind of how, how you can program that using um, different triggering events within the code itself. Um, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at that. So what you'll see here is we have three coding adventure courses and we have three skill mode courses here. Um, each of these basically, even if you have all of the courses assigned to them, they will not unlock until they progress through the challenges themselves. And the same exact thing happens for skill mode. Skill mode challenges only open up as they work through the course themselves. So that's just something to keep in mind and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. So here you can see I've already finished the course. So I'm going to click redo here. Um, it will bring me right to the beginning and the storyline here for this one is that the gorilla comes to steal this monkey's bananas that he's collected. So he's sad and then he gets mad and that becomes the, that becomes the mission for the game, the coding game, okay? So we can see some different features here that I'll just kind of mention. We have the stage on the left hand side where everything is taking place. We have our editor on the right hand side. And then every time you hover over the text here, um, it will actually type out for you. So anything that kind of has white text will type out as well as the buttons here at the bottom. So that really helps for students that are, you know, not so strong in spelling. Um, a lot of times our ELL students, I've had dyslexia students have run, come running up to me and they're so excited because they can code and program and they don't feel like they're doing what they call baby coding. So it's really um, nice to see that as well. This one is set up a little bit more robustly than the previous concepts or the previous courses that we went over. Here, Gordo is the teacher assistant and he pops up with directions, but if the kids don't read the directions, as you know, happens all the time, he's always hanging out over here in the left-hand side of the screen. So you always have the ability to click on him and make sure that the students are, you know, checking him out and seeing what he's doing. Um, we can also see that this is also set up in a story map the same way as our other courses were. Um, what happens here in this course specifically is that every, story, every map in the story is a different coding concept building complexity as it goes. So let me just show you a couple of features here and then I'll show you what some, how it builds in, builds as it goes. So here we're looking at this, this tells us that we need to turn left and turn right. It's the first time that the students are really learning the directionality piece. Um, if I just run this as is, we'll see that there will be a tip here and this tip tells me to turn right instead of turning left. So what I'm actually going to do is I am also going to pick up this ruler, measure the distance and ensure that that is in fact the distance. What this ruler will also do in later challenges is also do angle measurements as well. But let's say that I am a new coder, don't understand how to do this. So I erase it and I'm like, oh, this must be the solution. So, oops, forgot to change this first part here. I say turn right and I got rid of that. Now we'll see that the tip will simulate for where I am as far as in the lines of code. So that also helps scaffold that for those students who are gonna be online. You're not having that face-to-face -face interaction. There's some extra supports built in to really um, prop them up and have that confidence that they can move through these challenges um, without 9,000 questions coming to you through whatever learning management system you're having or however you're communicating with your students. Um, and then we saw that that was 12, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to spread that out. And what you'll then see is that I won't get the full three stars for the solution because I didn't write the shortest, most concise code possible. It will also give me a tip along, that, along those lines, letting me know how I can actually get more efficient code as well. Um, and then here it would just, Gordo will either cheerlead, sometimes he introduce concepts that the students are working on. So just some different capabilities that Gordo has there in himself. Um, and then the next challenge that we're going to go ahead and look at is we just talked about first steps and let me just show you an example of skill mode. What happens is Gordo turns less into a teacher assistant and more into a coach. He basically turns into this really cute track suit that he has going on here. Um, and if I turn, let's see here, you guys can kind of hear the sounds a little bit. I have the narration turned off. This one does have a narration feature into it. Um, there are, this course specifically is programmed also into a lot of different languages. So you have to have different types of learners that are in different kinds of native languages. What's wrong with receiving the instructions in a different, in their native language, but the coding itself is always English, no matter where you are. 
um, we'll see that there's a lot more thinking that's involved. There's a lot more algorithmic thinking that's happening here. And how do we actually solve this challenge? So those will report back to you in the same way as the other challenges do on the teacher side of it, which I'll show you that as well. So let's go ahead and let's explore. And I'm just gonna go ahead and mute that. So let's go ahead and let's explore now through the next set of um, challenges. So I went through and we did, um, there's object oriented programming and, and some different things that come through here, but you'll see in challenge 47, it starts to get pretty um, robust in nature. So now we start working with variables here. Um, what we see here is we have a variable statement. So um, it's a really an additive pattern. So there's lots more math being taken into place. So here we can see that the first time the monkey moves, he needs to move four, then he moves eight, then he moves 12, then he moves 16. And what we have here is a variable which has a container. And so the container's value is four. And then what we'll see here is that he'll step that container value and then step backwards of that container value. So if we run this the first time, we'll see that his value, something is changing here and it's hard to see because it's only changing by one here, um, but it is changing a little bit. So what we wanna see is that we know that the difference between each of these is actually four. So what happens is that the starting container value is four, but when it gets to this variable statement at the end, then it will add four and the next time it will start at that value. So the first time it starts at four, then it will go to eight, then it will go to 12 and then it will go into 16. So you'll see um, the variables are just there just so you can kind of see how that increases in complexity. So um, that will report back to you on that side. And then let's go ahead and see how that kind of advances through the concepts themselves. So um, just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna completely dive into all of these exactly, but then you start seeing that you now have um, variable where you're actually defining the variables and exactly what those mean. Um, and then it just gets a little bit more robust as it goes along. And then by the time they get to the end here, they will have done full gamification. And like I said, triggering events that are happening here. And so now we're starting to do what is an on key. If I press a certain key, what happens? If I click on the hippo, what's going to happen? So it just is going to be building as it goes. So like I said, that foundational building skill that's there. All right, so now we've taken a look at uh, coding adventure. I'm gonna talk about, I'll talk about lesson mode. I know I mentioned I was gonna talk about it here, but I'll talk about it when we get into the teacher resource side of things. Um, next up, we have our challenge builder and the challenge builder actually supports coding adventure and why would you use challenge builder? Um, the challenge builder is a free form creation tool and it's really good for, for students to show mastery of learning as well as extra practice. You can differentiate here. Um, it's one thing for students to basically showcase um, what they've learned by progressing through the course itself, but it's another thing for them to be able to build and create their own challenges to show mastery. And so down underneath our creativity tool, we'll see that challenge builder is here. Um, and basically as the students work through the challenges, new characters and objects are introduced. So those will be, um, they'll open up as they meet those challenges. And here you'll see it's a really good place to talk about digital citizenship, making sure you have appropriate language that you're using and the students will build and create their challenge for them to share. So if they're struggling with simple loops, it's a really good place for them to go ahead and show mastery of that learning. So lots of places for them to basically have that additional practice, okay? What we can see is the configuration. This is the background, so the behind the scenes that the students don't typically see with the X and Y coordinates and the rotational things of that. You can add buttons that the students have been introduced to. You can change the background. Um, just a lot of different features here. We do have a challenge builder guide that is lesson 15 in coding adventure. Um, but if you don't want to wait before then, I tend to like to do it after I feel like students have come to concepts that might be a little bit of struggle or maybe they really progress through them. So I like to have them repeat that and share it out. They can share it with the classroom. We also have some features for them to share to discover. So once you have this, basically this link will pop up. I'll just say I have this here, step 10. And I hit share. <laughs> or I hit save and then I hit share, we'll share it to the classroom or to, um, or to, I can just save it and it will show on the teacher side or we do have a discover feature and that will be worldwide uh, version of that where anyone can go ahead and play those challenges. They are heavily vetted. So we'll talk about that as well. 
but I just wanted to mention that. All right, so then next up we had our um, challenge builder. So what that's for, we also have a Dodo Does Math course that's just a supplemental. It's also CoffeeScript as well. I see there's a question about CoffeeScript. I'll answer that here in a little bit as well. Um, so with the, with the Dodo Does Math course, basically it is a supplemental. So it has three courses of which there are here. There's distances, angles, and multiplication. Students need to get through the first 30 challenges of coding adventure which is going to be um, what we consider an hour of code. And then once they do, then they'll work through those coding so concepts with math heavy concepts here. So we'll take a look at this. Um, there's also loops and different things that they work into, but let's just say that we um, are in a challenge that we've done before. This is the multiplication one, the ruler, the protractor one is really cool. They pick up a ruler, they do angle measurements and that kind of a thing. So here we can see that each of these planks are worth five and that we have four of them. So how far will he'll step? He'll step 20. And then what he'll do is he'll get to the end here and pick up his eggs. So the dodo loses his eggs on a turtle's back. He lays them there by accident. And then he spends the rest of the time collecting his eggs. What's really cool about this is that Gordo will talk about distributive properties, different types of math concepts that are here. And here you can see that he describes what the equation is that we just did. So that's also in the copy script and then directly following the Dota this math, like I mentioned, there's three courses there. Um, the first 30 adventure, there's also six um, 45 minute lessons that are there too and those will take less than a semester if you work through them once a week. Um, the game builder course is what we're going to talk about next. So this is really about the game design process. Um, so it's really teaching them the fundamentals of game design, and then they will then work on the creation piece of it. So there's three here. There's a platformer course, which is a Super Mario style, of course. Then there's Frogger, traditional type Frogger game, and then an animation course where they work on how to create animations within the game itself. And like I said, it's really designed to do the game mechanics, game mechanics. So let's look at the platformer course itself. What you'll see here is there's also bonus tasks that are inside of here, but what we'll see here is that this is now event driven programming. So when I push a key, something's going to happen and I make sure that there's different sprites that are here, um, different characters. We'll see on the right hand side is the stage in the game where it's happening. All of the objects that we can insert into the game are right over here. All of these buttons down here will also type out for students and why we suggest this for the older students, it's very text heavy. There's lots of reading that's involved. And really a lot of the students struggle because they don't do the reading that's involved and they think that they just see this code example and then that's the, the trick for them here. Um, but it is very fun and they really do enjoy the game design process, but they do need to have um, a little bit of skill set on the back end to be able to do that. So by the time they get to the end here, they'll have worked with um, different, different um, components of, game, of the game that they have itself. So they'll work with a, excuse me here. They will work with a chocolate bar. You'll see that there is a tiger that will go back and forth. There's a power up button that they interact with. They have a timer widget. There's also sounds that are here. Um, and then you can change the background of the game itself as well. So there's some different capabilities that are within the course themselves. I really suggest that they have at least some basis of at least finishing coding adventure before they start the game design, um, because it can be quite challenging without having the concepts of what a for loop is or just different components there. I'm not saying that's not doable. That's just what we suggest or what I suggest based on my own experience. Um, so like I mentioned, there's the three games of the platformer. Um, and now we'll move into our Python course, which is our Banana Tales course. So the Banana Tales course is really for grades five through eight. Um, because it is syntax, it does have, you know, the curly brackets and things like that. We do suggest it for the older grades. Um, it just helps them have a stronger foundation, like I mentioned. There are 23 45 minute long lessons that go with that. Um, it's in Python and they work on lists and index and for loops, if and else while if and else, while loops, Boolean operators, um, functions, and then they work into like scopes and lists and bubble sorts and um, lots of concepts as far as that goes. So let's take a look at what that course looks like itself. It's going to have the same thing. The storyline here is that these two, there are twin baby monkeys. Okay, these are chosen by kiddos here, these monkeys. They get separated and they have to work through the course, basically, the students have to work through the course to connect them. 
Um, this baby monkey here is unable to feed himself, so he needs us to feed him. So this remote control car, sometimes it's in a boat, this object needs to get to our monkey itself to feed him or else he gets upset. Something that's really great about this game that I love is that you can see um, the coordinates that are here. When you click on the level, you can see exactly where the object is located. So we can see exactly where the giraffe is located itself. Um, and it's just nice to kind of have those components there. There's also built-in reference cards. I'll mention where to access those for the other courses as well, but there are built-in reference cards. So the first time they talk about height is in challenge two, and those cards will open up as they progress through the game itself. Um, so here we have the giraffe height. So I drag another giraffe out. And what I need to do is I need the neck of the giraffe to stretch. And when he stretches, then I click on the car and now the baby monkey can be fed and he is a happy camper. Um, and then as we progress through here, let's just take a look. Um, and the same scoring system is happening throughout all of the courses, like I mentioned, except for the game builder, it's more of a pass fail with the stars for extra scoring. Um, here we can see there's also the snake. So the snake needs to, do we need the snake? What do we need to have happen? We can see we need to add snake, we need the giraffe's heads to shrink so, this, so the snake's heads can stretch out so we can actually get to the monkey himself and we'll see it working through on the left-hand side. What's really nice is there's hints here. And then when they work through some of the harder concepts, you can see it working in the console itself, which is also really great. Looks more so like a gamified um, computer programmer would use. And like I said, it does build in complexity as it goes and they move through the story map and we can see where they're going to be approaching the different concepts that are here. Um, and then by the time they get to the end of this course, they'll have worked with slicing. And so that's just, if you are a programmer yourself, you'll kind of know that. If you're not, there are some really great notes for the Python course itself that will really help support that. So um, you can just see how the levels are building in complexity as it goes. Um, okay. I'm just going to quick brief touch on these other two courses. And then if you guys have follow-up questions, we'll be happy to answer those just so I can get into the teacher resources. Um, directly following that, we recommend this coding chatbot course. They work through the Python concepts to build an interactive chatbot that plays a game of snowman, formerly hangman. It's not appropriate. So we now call it snowman. Um, so they're playing that type of a game with him. And so they'll go through the process. It's very similarly set up to the game design course itself where they're working through the challenges and as they progress, the challenges are opening up and they're going to be able to interact and chat over here on the side. By the time they get to challenge 74, you'll see, cause I'm on the teacher side of things, you'll see that the, they have worked through a lot of code to be able to create this chatbot itself. So it is pretty complex and we do suggest it for the older grade levels just based on the experience level that they have. Um, we do have some other courses that I forgot to mention. The Game Builder has its own Game Builder platform, similar to the Challenge Builder itself. Um, and then there's just uh, the other, only other one that I missed here was the Moonlander course. And that's just going to be a similar to the game design one, but with um, landing on the moon and physics and thrust. And they work through some of those different concepts. All right, so that was a lot on that side of things, and I'll be sure to leave some time for questions. I just really want to honor your time as well. So now let's talk about our teacher resources and how we can support you on the back end. I've seen a lot of questions about experience level and some different things like that, so I want to make sure that we're supporting you in that way as well. So that was the tour of the courses, and now let's talk about the teacher resources and how that will help you support. I see a lot of people being like, oh, what, if I, what do I do if I'm not a coding teacher or I don't have a strong background? Let me show you what we can do to help support you. So here I am in the, map, in the classrooms page. Um, we'll get into this side of, there, of things, but on the left-hand side, we have the teacher resources. And in the teacher resources, here is where you have everything that you're going to need. So all of our fully guided lesson plans are located here. Um, our webinars from past webinars that we've had. You can also visit our YouTube channel for more of our webinars that we've done from years past, like a few years ago as well. Um, I highly recommend this Teaching with Coding Adventure course. What it does is walks you through the first um, concepts that are in the first part of Coding Adventure all the way up to four loops. It's me, so you guys are welcome. Um, and basically what we do is we work through what exactly is a for loop, what does it mean, what does it look like in these challenges, so you have a firmer concept um, of understanding that you can, you know, that you can kind of grasp together. So you can have a little bit more background knowledge when you're 
um, when you're kind of working through that. So I highly recommend it. I think that it really gives you a strong skill point or, you know, skill set. When I first started learning how to code myself, I was able to work through it, but I wasn't able to explain some of the concepts. So I actually completed the original course that we had. And then I was like, oh, okay, I understand what these concepts are. So if I can do it, you could do it. Um, so that's what that looks like. Let's take a look at one of the lesson plans, just so you kind of have an idea. They are set up in a slide deck format. Um, each of them has, you know, the, what the lesson is going to be about. They all have objectives in them, and then they are all standards aligned, and then we will talk about the concepts that you're covering here. Um, each of the lessons are set up in exactly the same way. There's an intro, which is an unplugged activity, which you can do via remote instruction. Um, so a lot of times people think you have to be directly like really unplugged, but you can show an object on the screen and have the students write it out in a Jamboard or some, you know, maybe in a Padlet or something like that to have them write out the instructions of how to solve a challenge. Or you can pop a challenge up there, take a screenshot, throw it up there and kind of, you know, work through that together in that way. Um, and then the second part is going to the, be the playtime where the students are actually playing the course itself. And then the last part is going to be the debrief where they're actually going to be working through, you know, reflectionary questions. What happens if you get stuck? What did you notice about that? And they'll work through those concepts as they go. And that's like that same format for all of them, except for um, the Beaver Achiever course. It does give you more so just a different, it's just a little bit different of a format there. Um, we do have, um, I do want to mention this only because it's, it's important. So we do have lesson plans for the banana tails. And then we also have um, these classroom slides. So these are ones that you, these lessons are basically um, already created for you to share with your students. Like what do you do? How do you write the code? So there's a little bit more um, support on that. So there's like the classroom notes that walk you through what everything means, which I tend to rely upon quite a bit. Um, so you can use these notes here or you can use the slide deck itself. So just some extra features to kind of you know, have in your back pocket. Um, we do have this how-to guide. These are just guides basically um, for how to add students, archive a class, getting started, um, hour of code notes, and then classroom resources. These are certificates here. We have our media kit, which is access to all of our images, like course images and things like that. That's cute, like fun graphics. Um, and then we have our posters here. These are just visual posters and we do have coloring sheets if you want as well. Um, something new that we just added, if you did my other webinar, you already know this, but um, we, you can now access all of the solutions here in the teacher resources and you don't actually have to go to the progress page itself. All of the courses are here, the skill mode challenges, Hour of Code, Code Monkey Junior, all of the courses themselves are exactly located here. So I did mention that I would talk about the Code Monkey Junior course. Um, so here is what it would look like and you basically pick up these um, arrows and you would run through those courses. So there's sequencing, advanced sequencing loops and advanced loops. And it's really cute and fun and the kids really enjoy that. So just wanted to briefly touch that just in the interest so I can leave time for Q&A for you guys. Okay, moving on. Now we're gonna talk about um, the lesson mode feature. And then we're also going to talk about, oh no, we're also gonna talk about um, the, sorry guys, we're also going to talk about the, um, let me pull this up. I actually got rid of, out of my slide deck there. So I'm just pulling this back up for you guys. Um, we'll talk about the lesson mode, which is something that I mentioned that we would talk about. Okay, so we are on our classrooms page here and I will go into any of the classrooms that I created. Um, we are integrated with Google Classroom in both Clever. If you want to import your, um, <clears throat> if you want to import your classes, there is the ability to do that. We have some really great help articles on that as well. Um, let me just go to another classroom here. Oops, excuse me. So we'll go into this. Oh, I'm on the struggle bus here. You can see. Um, so I'll go into my classroom that I've created here and what we'll see is right away it will pop us out at the progress page. I personally find this to be the holy grail of everything that, that we um, have on our pages because it contains everything. Every single star contains a student solution and you can see it in real time if you click on it. So we'll show you exactly how they solved it. You can sort by student progress so you're able to see 
you know, do a quick data dive and to see exactly how far students, students got, where you see a lot of blue stars, where you saw, see a lot of red stars. When you click on any of the stars, any one of the stars, you can see how many times the student attempted the challenge. And if you pull it up, you can pull it, you can see exactly how they solved it. It's actually anonymous too, which makes for really great instruction, especially in a remote environment. You guys can share that, you know, with your students on the screen and you can work through it together. Um, you can also limit the progress so you lock them down so they're not working too far in ahead, which is why you see this part grayed out. If I do free play, it opens completely up. Um, we can also turn off the super hints. So Gordo, I didn't show you that, but Gordo does have um, super hints that he has and he has an extra light bulb that pops up and that will guide the students more. It never gives the answer, but it will guide them. You can also export all of this data to a CSV file. And why I mentioned that is it will tell you exactly the times that the students logged in. Sometimes that's important. I know, I know in the spring when COVID first happened, um, teachers were really trying to figure out how to take attendance. And so they were using this data file to be able to do that. Um, and then up here in green are all the solutions that you saw on the teacher resource page, um, but now they're also here for you on this page and it is reporting back to you in real time. So that's pretty important. Now the lesson mode feature here, this is only available for our coding adventure course. It is set up exactly like our lessons. And what happens is when you begin the lesson itself, the student screens lock and they don't have access to the courses themselves. Um, there are reference cards and character review cards. The character review card is very important for um, when you're doing the challenge builder. So you can know exactly when those, when those characters are introduced. So we can see here in challenge 13 is when we meet our turtle and when we do object tag or object oriented programming. Um, and so the turtle will open up for use then, then the beaver will open up in challenge 55. So it's just kind of good to know, but it's also good for the students to understand how do I actually program and move these characters, especially later on when they are working through through that itself. And what's also really nice is that you have access to the challenges that are in the specific lesson right there. You're not going to have to hunt and navigate multiple screens. And then when you're ready, you can assign those challenges. And sometimes in the debrief, like you can see here, there's some challenges that you'll work through. Um, so just different components are located all right here for you. And there is this short tutorial, which um, my team will pop here in the chat for you. So you guys can see exactly how to do those lessons themselves. On the student tab, I'm not really going to mention months about the student tab, not really much to do here, except for um, there is a direct login URL. If you're in person, you can do login cards, um, but here's where you will add your co teachers to your account so you can share the classroom. Um, and then just super quick, you can assign courses here and then the grade book is automatically graded the students as they're working through the challenges. They do have a specific point value and then they'll be populated here. What's nice about this is that at the bottom of the page, the more students that struggle with the challenge, the larger the circle is. So that's just something to keep in mind. And also makes for those great mini lessons for you to teach on um, without having to hunt through the progress page if you don't want as well. You can also export this as a CSV, which is really nice as well. Um, I know that's what I used to do, export it as a CSV and upload it into my grade book. So um, you have that capability as well. And then when we talked about the games and challenges earlier, when the students publish them to the classrooms, this is where they will be showcased for you. Yours are in the My Creations, but the students are here for you. You can search by student. You can also disable the Discover feature. Um, just keep in mind with the Discover um, that it is heavily vetted and it makes a copy of their of their game or challenge so that they can't go back and edit it and try to be sneaky like they try to do. So those are just some different things to keep in mind there. Okay, it's a lot of information and I see a lot of questions. So we're gonna kind of go through that. Um, so we talked about how to track student progress. Oh, there was one thing that I wanted to mention. Our newest feature here under the grade book is we now have this, um, it's called a proficiency table. And so in the proficiency, it will show you the concepts that are without all of, throughout all of the coding adventure, I mean, throughout all of the CodeMonkey platform. And it will tell you exactly how the students did. So we have a novice, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. It'll tell you how, how um, proficient basically they are in those concepts. Just remember that these are concepts that are throughout all of the course, like sort you only see obviously in banana tails. So, um, but you'll see sequencing in all the courses. You'll see simple loops in all of the courses. So just some different things that you'll see. And it's just kind of nice to have something extra um, in your back pocket. Alrighty, so now we've talked about tracking student progress. We talked about the classroom dashboard. 
And now we went through the tour de courses. And um, we're going to leave some time for some Q&A. But before we do the Q&A portion, I see there's a lot of things that I'll go back here and answer for you. Um, so I did want to talk about that we do have the Code Monkey webinar page. My team is going to put that there in the chat box for you. Um, so the webinars are located there. As I mentioned, it's also located on our YouTube channel where you can see all of the past recordings that we've done and anything that's upcoming will be on the webinar page itself. We do have some student guided lessons that we've done um, during the COVID period where we took over your classrooms and kind of taught some of the students. So if you're looking for some examples, I would suggest looking there as well. Um, I talked about the proficiency table, the grade book, um, and then just one last thing that I did want to mention that will also be great for you is in the courses, sorry, in the My Classrooms page, um, there is a place where you can generate a usage report. So if you're the account admin or you just want to see your classrooms, you'll basically pull this up here and it will show you exactly how often the kids are, kids are using the program in each class. So that's also something to just kind of keep in mind. All right, now I know we're, we're pushing time here, so I just want to make sure that I cover that. Now we're going to leave time for Q&A. I am going to answer these questions that are here, and then I'm also going to answer those there. So if you are running short on time, just know that we're just doing Q&A right now. So um, how would I use a tool like this to create lessons for three different grades? So what you would do is you would create three your classrooms, and then you would assign the specific courses to them. I would suggest using like a learning management system like either Google or Canvas or something like that to create the lessons. And I basically would just do, um, let's say have them, you're working on the coding adventure course, you have them work through challenge 20, create a challenge build, their own challenge in the challenge builder, they share that with you and then you're able to see their progress in both places. Um, best, best practices for hybrid or online learning using code monkey lessons. I would say using those super hints, um, doing some lessons whole group together. I know that that sounds like, oh, I don't want to do that, but really solving some challenges together using a Jamboard or a Padlet or some other resource there to kind of work through that together is what I would suggest. Um, can you add code monkey grades to the classroom? What I didn't mention is that you can actually in the code monkey lessons itself, you can actually assign the lessons to your Google Classroom and those grades will also report to your Google Classroom. If I'm correct, I believe I am. Um, it will also report back there too. And then how to teach a remotely while live integrating STEM areas, including technology into grades K through five. Like I mentioned, I would do a lot of those unplugged activities using a Jamboard or something like that. And I would also try to, you know, maybe use a code monkey like challenge number seven in coding adventure has the first time that they're using um, the ruler as an angle measurement or using the Dota does math courses are really going to be good for those integration areas. Um, we have the moon lander for the older grades. Um, that's really science driven. Personally, I would create stories with the coding adventure um, challenge builders. That's what I would do um, for those. So I would use the challenge builder and have them use the save feature, which they learned in like challenge, challenge fit in around in the fifties and they would say something and they would use a story. So I would make a math story personally with my challenge builder. So there's lots of ways and abilities to do that, um, that you can kind of do that you can kind of progress. Okay. So is it possible to see students answers, even if the wrong attempts have been made? Um, so that is true. You can, when you go into that progress page, you can click on it. It will show you exactly how the student solved it. If they got the answer incorrect, it will have a circle with like an exclamation point. It just means they failed the challenge. Typically that doesn't usually happen, but <coughs> excuse me, you will be able to see that every time a student works through a challenge, it's being held there in the progress page. So thank you for that question. Um, do I need to have a different LMS or the CodeMonkey as a self-sufficient platform? I think that depends on you. I personally would do an LMS in addition to that. I think that you can obviously do everything in the CodeMonkey platform. The only thing that you're not able to do is to do that communication. So if you're doing the communication in Google Meet or in Zoom, then I think you're fine. I think just sometimes the, stu the students, you can also post discussion questions like post a challenge or an unplugged activity have them solve it. Maybe they do their own unplugged activities like a TikTok video or something, just some way for them to have some submission. There's no place for you to do any kind of submission or assigning assignments really, except for in the challenge, except for in the lesson mode, but that's only um, during that short period of time. 
So great question. Okay, so I think um, Molly or Brett, do you guys want to pop on with any um, questions that you guys that I might have missed here? I think you've answered all of the questions. The only thing to clarify is the integration with Google Classroom. Um, we unfortunately do not have the capabilities to do a great pass back from okay. CodeMonkey to Google Classroom, but you can export your grades to a CSV file and then use that file if you need to manipulate it somehow to get it back to Google Classroom. Okay, great. Do you guys have, does anyone else have any questions that we can help answer? Um, I see there was a lot of good conversation happening here on the side. Okay, well, if you guys do have any questions that kind of um, pop up here, I do see a few questions here. Um, um, there is a question here about emailing. We will follow up with you um, regarding Um, regarding the your question about your quote requests and things like that. So we do have a couple of um, questions that are um, that will follow up with you that we've mentioned beforehand. So um, I apologize. I see that everyone should hopefully be able to see each other's comments. My my apologies. Um, Roberto will follow up with you following um, today's webinar. We really, really, really want to thank you guys so much for everything that you do every single day. We know that you guys are working harder than probably um, we have all in years, right? Um, with transitioning to the way that the classrooms are running and online and the, such the uncertainty that we have um, in front of us. I know that we didn't throw this into the chat box, but I did want to mention this just really briefly. I think it's an important concept in the help center here. There is some explanations on the coding adventure courses. So if you type in coding adventure, um, you're able to see some of the concepts that are covered. So if you're struggling on some of the concepts that are there or the terminology, it's all located here in the help page. So I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. Um, but like I mentioned, we want to thank you so much for all of your questions, your active engagement during this time. Um, we really enjoyed spending the afternoon with you and remember to follow us on all of our social platforms where you can get, you know, lots of update information and about our blogs. Um, just remember that we're here for any questions that you have. We really want to ensure that you have the best teaching experience possible while using CodeMonkey. And from our team to yours, we want to thank you for all that you do today, tomorrow, and all the days in between to get your students future ready. And remember to write code, catch bananas, and save the world. Until next time, bye-bye.